What is up, y'all? Kevin Kuhn here from Athlete Factors. This is the Athlete Factors podcast. My guest today is strength coach David Accardo. How's it going, David? Doing well, but how about you? I'm doing very well. So you are a high school strength and conditioning coach? Yes, sir. In my eighth year at, at uh, Friends with ISD now. Nice. That's awesome. That's awesome. So you're joining us to talk about a couple different things. So we'll kind of bullet point those up front just so people have kind of an idea of, of what we'll be discussing. But um, we're going to talk a little bit about lifting some heavy stones, which is always a cool thing. For sure. Um, for sure. We'll talk a little bit about how all of our viewers and listeners can help you out and help your weight room out and uh, getting it a little heavier. Sounds good. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about um, some 3D printing. <laughs> Hobbies are always good to have, that's for sure. Yeah, awesome. So let's dive into a little bit of your background. So tell us a little bit about um, your ventures in athletics and academics and kind of how you got into into the role of uh, high school strength coach. Well, I, uh, I went to high school out wet in the west side of Houston at May Creek High School, did pretty well in football, uh, did just well enough against some really, really good football players that were in our district to get some eyes from recruiters. Um, I ended up going to Louisiana Tech on a full ride uh, scholarship as an offensive lineman. Uh, redshirted there, got to know my strength coach really, really well, doing 5 a.m. workouts for the first year. Um, because I wasn't traveling, so therefore the ones that don't travel do a lot more building and getting ready for the next year. Um, in that, uh, I, I had two strength coaches in college. My first one for my first year was uh, Yancey McKnight, who's now at, at UT. Um, I mean, just taught me a, a, the, everything a, Everything I really, truly believe in started that year as far mm. as how to, a weight room is run, organization, from like, communication, even like cues in the weight room. Like, Coach McKnight's one of the top in the nation still today and what he does. And uh, it was it was a pleasure to work with him, especially as a, as a first year athlete in a program like that. So once he left, uh, Coach Damon Harrington came in with the next staff and he was actually a linebacker at Louisiana Tech as an athlete, went to a couple of different universities and came back as a head strength coach. And then and I had him for four more years after that. And he was a, a much more high energy guy, more more like the the, the rah rah like you really let's let's get hyped up before we get under a big bar stuff like that so uh, I, I got the best of both worlds it's on the the logical and the science side and also like the the hype up motivational side as well all of my time as an athlete at La Tech um, nice. as I said I redshirted I had a I had for my first two years my redshirt year and my and my 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 sophomore year redshirt sophomore year um, I had a all conference offensive lineman that was a senior ahead of me and he he really taught me like how to how to base practices how to train different parts of my body and this and that and how to mm. really get ready for the sport of football and um as i as i went through my undergrad i got my, my bachelor's in science and kinesiology and health promotion um did a whole bunch of classes that were part prereq and part part with things i truly wanted to learn about mm -hmm. and i got really more and more excited about training athletes in a group setting and a team setting that I, that I got to have as an athlete as a football player at la tech um I finished my master's uh, about a qu it was a quarter system at Louisiana Tech. So I finished about a quarter and two quarters early. So my senior football season, I was still taking courses and kind of doing like a dual credit into my master's program. Mm -hmm. So I, pre I finished pretty much half my master's before I finished my senior football season. Nice. And then decided to keep working towards it and move on through there and got my master's also in kinesiology and sport performance. Um, walked across the stage with my master's degree, uh, drove straight out to Los Angeles and worked at USC as an intern. Um, came back to Houston at U of H, worked there with, with a whole bunch of sports at, at U of H's staff at the time. Um, I guess uh, Herman was there as the football coach. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, someone was. Someone was the head football coach. And Coach Jackson was with him. I think Jackson's now at the, the Cleveland Browns, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, the last time I ch checked in with him. Um, from there, I, I, I was actually at my at, at U of H when I got a call from one of my friends to work to help him out with the Minnesota Twins double A camp in Connecticut. So I did uh, double A ball for a season and uh, in the Northeast, which I, I uh, I'm not too fond of snow <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm not too fond of uh, small bus seats. But uh, <laughs> every every three to five days driving halfway across oh. the, the Northeast from, from Maine to 
to Akron, Ohio, down to Richmond, oh. Virginia, all around the, the Northeast uh, seaboard. It was a, it was an interesting, very creative part of my, my career. <laughs> like we could be having a workout at a really outfitted gym or a closet underneath the stadium mm-hmm. or at a planet fitness where we're not allowed to make noise or we get kicked out for the lunk alarm. So that's right. Um, which I do hold that as a, as a record in my career that I did get kicked out with two of my, my outfielders. When we had a squat day at a planet fitness. The, the alarm went off and they came over uh, sir. We know y'all are sponsored to be here for the team, but we need you to kind of not scare our, our clientele like that. I was like, wow. I mean, he grunted under four Oh five. Like, what do you want us to do? <laughs> <laughs> like i'm gonna make some noise with four plates in the bar i don't know about you but yeah so uh, i got, got to be kicked out of a gym almost by at planet fitness um that's a red I, badge of courage oh the- for sure for sure so. I, that's, that's one of my mainstays i'm gonna have it on my wall when i when i retire <laughs> school bells uh <laughs> i uh after i got done with that season with the minnesota twins i realized that that traveling on a bus or an airplane everywhere is not really too much fun. So I came back to Houston and promised my then fiance now wife that I was going to try and stay in the Houston area. Um, I was talking with our mutual friend, Garson Skelton, and he said that he had a spot at a private facility in the West side of Houston, back kind of where I grew up. So I went out there and, and checked it out, kind of liked the facility. So uh, he had left to, to go to a new spot. So I kind of picked up his clientele, which Garson's an amazing strength coach, really good at building relationships. So he had a really mm-hmm. tight group of people that truly believe in him. And they accepted me, this mm-hmm. much uglier bearded guy that <laughs> came in to, to, to train them. So I had to earn their, their responsive uh, relationship that they had earned. And Garson had already earned. So mm-hmm. uh, they, they welcomed me in. I was there for a while. It, it, it wasn't truly what I wanted to do, but it was a spot filler. Our class has started. There we go. <laughs> I uh, and I, I realized that it was the team setting that I was missing. So, like from all my my years of college football through the co- the universities I worked at and the Twins, it was always that team situation where these guys and girls had to come in and get better for what they truly liked. Mm-hmm. And I didn't have to kind of persuade and help out and be just nice enough to keep them coming back and pay. So. Um, yeah looking out for spots all across the, the city of Houston because my wife had just gotten a really good job and I wanted to keep her there. So we, we talked about it and ended up being like a, a Google alert in my wife's email that was like, hey, a strength coach position popped up. So it was wow. a small it was a small little uh, blurb on the Galveston Daily News uh, about this high school of South of Houston that was just got a new head coach and athletic director and they were looking to hire an offensive line coach, a receivers coach, and a, sorry, a defensive coordinator. And a strength and addition position was opening up, so I was like, "That sounds like fun, man. Let's let's try it out." So yeah. that day, I sent in my application. Two days later, I had the interview, and I had the I had the job a day later. So that was wow. now eight and a half and almost nine years ago. So I've been here ever since. I got thirteen sports. I think about six hundred and forty athletes this year. Wow. Um, one hundred and fifty PE students that will come and see me, and they all come through the weight room two to four days a week, depending on. Uh, which team and that what part of their year they're in. So that, mm-hmm. that brings me to today. I'm, I'm a married man with a five and a three year old and I work with almost 700 kids every week, twice a week. So that's awesome. That's it's really a lot cool. It's a lot of Excel spreadsheets for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you mean you're not just like uh, running everything just off the, uh, off the front of your brain just as it, as it happens. I, uh, I'm not saying I have brain damage from football, but I don't have the, <laughs> I don't have the capacity to keep everything in my head, so I got to have everything written down. So, man, no, I I think that's wise. Like you can't you can't just play by ear. Yeah. Like you you've got to have a plan set up. So, um, I think uh, perhaps the perhaps the uh, common thought when it comes to high school strength coaches, and maybe maybe it was this way 10, 15, 20 years ago, was you know it's just. You know, one of one of the assistant football coaches who likes to lift weights and and, you know, they're filling in in that position. But it's it's really changing. And and especially here in Texas, I think like the role of the high school strength coach is is becoming more and more of a of an understood, genuine profession. And it's people like you, it's people like Garson who take that position seriously who understand the the impact that they're not only have that they will not only have on the individual sports but really on the individual athletes and um 
yeah, you can you can be the best when it comes to um, to either interacting with the kids or the best when it comes to formulating a program for these youth athletes. But if you're not able to combine those things, then, um, you know, you're leaving a whole lot of, of performance on the table when it yeah. comes to the actual sport. But also, I mean, these kids, a lot of them won't go on to play sports after that. So just having an impact on their lives and helping push them in the direction of, of, healthy lifestyle and making uh, positive life choices that will benefit their body and their health down the road. Sure. I think that's super important. And, uh, you know, as someone who I work with youth athletes twice a week, um, I don't have, you know, six or 700 kids that I'm responsible <laughs> for. Thank goodness. But, I was about to say that's a blessing, <laughs> <laughs> but I love it. And so uh, being able to have conversations with, with other people who, you know, take that seriously, working with kids, working with youth athletes. Um, you know, I think it's, I think it's awesome. So I'm super pumped that you're here, uh, to have this conversation. So, um, before we get into, you know, some of the other stuff we talked about, uh, we'll, let's just cover kind of the basics of, of, you know, training high school athletes. Do you work with middle school as well, or is it just high school? So I, I am a, I work for a single high school district in Texas. So it's an independent school district, but we're not a multi high school. So we have one high school, one junior high and two elementaries. So gotcha. with the, what, the, with, so I'm fairly blessed in the fact that most of my kids know who I am or they know me personally from the end of their sixth grade year, all the way through their senior year. So I get almost wow. six years with each kid. Yeah. Um, if they stay in the sport, if they don't get cut, if they don't go to PE or, or to band or whatever it is mm-hmm. other for the other extracurriculars they might choose, which, which is good for them as long as they're doing something extra, you know, but mm-hmm. um, if, if a kid comes in at the end of their sixth grade year, they have a chance to go to what we call our, our MAC or a Mustang athletic camp in the summers. So with, they come in there, it's PVC pipes, small sandbags, working on body position, push up position, how to squat, how, where your knees should be all, a whole bunch of body awareness stuff in that first summer. Mm-hmm. And they go into their junior high seventh grade year where they'll play. We try to get them to play at least two, if not three, four five sports in the year, because mm-hmm. we want them to try everything and get them ready for whatever they may feel most comfortable with or whatever they feel most talented in. Mm-hmm. Um, then that's in their seventh and eighth grade year. So after that, they, they, they come back both of those camps in the summers as well. So by the time they walk on campus as a freshman, they've had two, maybe three summer camps with me personally, and then two full years with the coaching staff at our junior high who have, I, I, I'm more of a, I, not, I wouldn't say director role. They're, they're really good down there on their own. We have a couple of coaches that truly enjoy getting kids in the weight room and, and not working on weights on heavy stuff, but mm-hmm. body position and good, like PVC pipes. So we have pipes to fill with sand, small 25 pound bars, things mm-hmm. like that. So they can get in good position for like, I'm a firm believer. Dan John is one of my favorite guys to listen to on lectures and, and his podcast and his, all of his books. I have in a huge stack in my house. Oh yeah. Um, the, the, the five movements that every human should be able to do push, pull, carry, squat, and, uh, and hinge. hinge. Yep. Uh, thank you, sir. Yep. <laughs> <Got it. laughs> and, Love uh, Dan John. <laughs> and I, I firmly believe that, especially in our youth, like our kids are taught to sit in a desk for eight hours with mm-hmm. their hunched over, possibly looking at their cell phone. They become yep. like Chihuahua shoulder where they're rolled forward. Everything is closing in like they're already an old man. And mm-hmm. you have to counterbalance that by opening them back up, getting them back in good position. Cause I mean, uh, the or- original strength stuff shows like like a kid learns how to crawl before they walk, before they walk, and then they run. And and we learn how not to squat in our in our the way we live in our daily lives. So, mm-hmm. um, that that's the biggest blessing I have is that most of my kids come in as their freshman year already knowing the main basics of movement due to our junior high coaches giving me just the baseline things I want to be able to see. Have mm-hmm. good external rotation in a front squat with a with a PVC pipe back squat, mm-hmm. having a good proper position, good chin, head and chin position, and mm-hmm. being able to sit to death, pass death with comfortable, not, no pain of movement. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, a good push-up, good sit-up, maybe a pull-up or two, or even they're just going to be able to hold their body weight for 10 seconds. Mm-hmm. I can work with that over the next four years and get them to whatever basis of strength and, and power they want to get to. Um, mm-hmm. Because, again, like you said, I, I have 600 kids. There might be 6 to 20 of them that will play D1 sports. D two, D three, probably some more, mm-hmm. but 
the rest of them just need to be healthy adults that know how to keep themselves in shape and not be in pain when they leave high school because of whatever sport they played. Sure. Um, I want them to be strong mothers and fathers, good uncles and aunts, um, mm-hmm. grandparents that can pick up toys with their grandkids 25, 30 years from now um, to, to be healthy and good, good joint movement with minimal visits to, to physical therapists as possible yep. due to the, the, what we, we tax them with here. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the world's full of sport specificity as a, as a common theme. And like if my kid's only going to make it to college, if he plays one sport in his entire uh, year round. And I, I believe we've lost the love of sport for the, the gain of a possible scholarship, which has been watered down over the years over that everyone should get one. Cause everyone's special when, mm-hmm. which yeah, you can, you can love your kid to death, but like if, if you're five foot seven, and your wife's five foot four. He's not coming out six foot three and running a four three forty. Like it's, <laughs> it's, it's not. And it's okay to be a good high school uh, fo- uh, football player and go on earn your degree and be a good coworker. You know, like mm-hmm. that, that's not that's a great life to live. But for some yep. reason, it's been kind of, kind of poo pooed on to to be a a good athlete that didn't go anywhere. And I'm I would hope that in years to come that that pendulum swings back the other way. That it's okay to be really good at something, but to move on and do the next chapter of your life. So I, mm-hmm. I try to play to the, that middle third of kids that won't go play, but will come back and tell me, Hey coach, I was at, at the intramural center of in my university. And I was, some guy was asking me why I was doing something. I got to teach him stuff that you taught me. Like that, that's my hope that like mm-hmm. the, the average Joe still loves to get better and get stronger because I didn't ruin it for them by making them do horrible something that, that made them get away from the weight of the rest of their life. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, and again, if I do have the upper echelon kid that 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 God would give me every once in four years, that's like good at every sport he touches. That's mm-hmm. great too. I can I can help that kid be ready for the next level of sport they may play. Mm-hmm. But I I truly believe that as a whole, these kids just need to learn to love fitness again because fitness has become a punishment. Fitness has become a a, a something that's not necessary in, in the elementary and junior highs because we need to have more academics and more more standardized testing. So mm-hmm. when they get here, my I, I post a lot of videos of my females in the weight room because they truly have grown to enjoy getting better in there. And like that, I mean, I'll put my softball team up against anybody else in the nation, and let and, and truly given given a hundred percent effort in my weight room, they they've grown to love what they've seen from the dividends and getting strong and powerful when they hold mm-hmm. a bat or glove in their hand. So I, uh, it, it's been fun trying to be, become part of the bloodline with these kids that, that now officially after my two years ago was my first senior class that had me from their sixth grade year all the way through. So I'm officially hundred percent in the bloodline now. So that they, they know it's coming. So they got to either like it or, or tolerate it at least for four years. So. Get on board. The train's yeah, moving for sure. <laughs> That's awesome. I think, there, there are a few things more empowering to, to a youth athlete who's maybe struggling in a sport than getting strong in the weight room and being able to, to see some transfer over from the weight yeah. room onto the field. And, uh, um, yeah, if, if you can show kids and, and get them to buy into that, then, man, like that, it just – Talking about your your softball players, like that reminds me of a lot of the female athletes that I've worked with, and up up where I do some youth athletic development stuff. It's I'm working with kids as young as six, and then all the way through high school, and then if those kids go on to play college during their summer break and their winter break, when they come back home, like they're they're back with us. They're you know they're still training. So a lot of these kids, we get you know a really long time. Um, it may not be all the time, but just the length that they're that they're going at it. The kids that start really young, and who buy into it, and who first learn how to move, and then, you know, we're not layering uh, dysfunction, or we're not layering weight on top of dysfunction. We're teaching them how to move effectively first, and then slowly and gradually and progressively building up uh, their their competence in the weight room. Um, yeah, like they're just they're more confident, you know. They they are they're more sure of themselves while they're playing the sport, mm-hmm. and it's less that they have to, you know, think and worry about. Um, so I think that's great, man. Like, For sure. Um, yeah, if if you do it correctly, if you don't just throw somebody under a bar and say, hey, you know, 
get your get your ass to the grass, right? Squat really deep. Like, well, I don't know how. Well, just do it and, you know, you'll figure it out. Like, mm-hmm. maybe that's not the best way to do things, you know? So, um, but yeah, starting them young, man, that's, that's a good way to do it. Like, For sure. get them, get them comfortable in the weight room, but that doesn't mean you have to do everything in the weight room. So I think that's pretty good stuff. Um, so what, what are some of the most important, uh, factors that you kind of have in mind when you're coaching these, uh, high school athletes? Honestly, I, uh, I kind of, when we first bring kids in every year, even the, my senior group, my varsity groups that have been with me three to four years, um, we, we have a kind of a first day meeting that first week of school kids are getting their new schedules, getting their gear, the, the, all the, all the logistics are that first week of, of August and, and all of our teams, um, they come in, they have a meeting with me. We really don't lift any weights at that, that first meeting. We talk about expectations. What do they want from me? What do they need from me? Mm-hmm. And then on the other end, I give them what I expect and what I need from them. And I really bro- boil it down to the only two things that a high school kid can control is their attitude and their effort. And that, and that boils down a whole bunch of things down to two things. Mm-hmm. Um, if they're positive, if they, if, they have a, if they don't take anything personally, it's all based on that attitude thing they can handle. And then their effort if they give a hundred percent if they give if you have if your gas tank is empty and you have 20 percent left in your gas tank give me 20 100 percent of that 20 percent mm-hmm. and and we and we can make changes to whatever workout we have if y'all are beat up and banged up we can change it to to, to formulate to that but it takes communication with a positive attitude and 100 percent effort in that to, to work on um but the i mean from there the i may i i, I voice the fact that I'm not an Instagram coach. I'm not a, I'm not a, the, the footwork king with the speed ladder doing a thousand miles an hour. Foot, I, I am beating the hell out of the basics with these kids. Mm-hmm. Even as a sixth year athlete, fourth year in high school as a senior, they're going to be really good at the basic movements that we do. I'm not going to try and make them stand on a BOSU ball with bands hanging and kettlebells from here and a, a one eye covered and all the extra like bells and whistles of smoke and mirrors that you see mm-hmm. on on the thing that the video that, on Instagram that gets a thousand likes in an hour. Like, <laughs> I, I, I I'm probably the worst when it comes to that stuff because I don't I don't I, as an offensive lineman my entire life my name only got in the papers or on the loudspeaker if I messed up like mm-hmm. holding penalty blocking the back anything like that it was never hey the line did a really good job on that that run play where we got 96 yard run like no mm-hmm. that running back got 96 yards and we high five like i i've never been trying to put my name out there for the betterment of myself Mm -hmm. i'd rather have my kids in the forefront their names on in the newspapers they're the the, like even on my instagram i don't really like show just one kid on a video unless he's trying to break a record that we may or may not have at the time i'll Mm -hmm. pan the entire weight room show the 65 to 85 kids i have in there and like because we're all killing it yeah and You'll see them. Almost all my videos look the same. I do one big circle way above all my short athletes. And I'm, I'm, I'm seeing, you'll see kids squatting, kids hinging, kids pressing, kids pulling. And mm-hmm. that, that, that's, that's what we work on. And mm-hmm. it's not flashy. It gets boring at times, gets tedious at times. Mm-hmm. But if they give me good attitude and good effort, I, I, they will see true results from that. Mm-hmm. And, that, I mean, you could talk all the, all the ones and zeros, all the periodization, all the like keep it simple, block zero, APRE, range of percentages you want, but keeping a high school youth athlete excited about what they're doing truly is the only way to get a true result out of it. Like I could give mm-hmm. you the best periodized, periodized program, 12 sheet packet, but it's just a set of burned paper. If the kid doesn't believe in what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that kind of, then like, there's, I mean, there's a hundred ways to motivate a kid, internal, external motivation, this or that. Mm-hmm. But with, with most of my kids, if like in that first six weeks, giving them a couple cookies here and there to let them see a small one rep, two rep process of, of gain or PR, um, mm-hmm. that that small carrot rolls into a big snowball. So yep. um, keeping them motivated and then and especially my six year kids that are that have been doing it for so long, they get they can get run down pretty easily on doing the same things all the time. And mm-hmm. I'll, I'll put in competitions and things like that, but it's mainly. Um, just keeping them motivated for what we're we're planning on doing that week, that day, that mesocycle, microcycle of, of, the, of the part of the year. So, mm-hmm. awesome, yeah, that is 
that is one of those things if you're if you're changing everything up and every time they come into the weight room it's like hey we've got to spend 20 minutes learning this brand new exercise like, well, we just yeah. learned one yesterday and that took us half an hour like yeah you can keep kids uh you can maybe keep their interest and they're they're maybe a little more likely to maintain a, a fresh attention span but you're not going to get the results you're not going to get progress so um yeah like the you gotta, you gotta keep the fun in fundamentals, right? Yeah. <laughs> and and there's not a week that I've been here over my eight years where there hasn't been a kid running in with their cell phone on. Hey, coach, check this video. Why don't we do something like this? <laughs> well, well, we do, but we're not. We don't need to do a push up on eight dumbbells. We do push ups mm -hmm. normal. Like, mm -hmm. oh, we don't have to have a band hanging with a 25 pound shaky bar bench. Like, we we work on control because like, when are you going to be standing on uneven ground? that shakes underneath you while mm -hmm. playing the sport of baseball. I mean, yeah. there are some pretty crappy fields that we play at, but nothing's going to be literally shaking underneath you to where you need to truly control that much of a neuromuscular adaptation to, to a uneven ground. So I, yeah. uh, like there's, but I mean, besides like the whole, how you, how you get a kid to really truly like the process. That, that's a big, like low, like we'll love the process. Well, that process is different everywhere you go. And here at Friendswood, we literally need to be perfect at the bare minimum basics because, I mean, we may not have the best, fastest, strongest, biggest kids out there in any sport we play, but every team that leaves our home field, our home courts, our home, our home, our, uh, even our pool, um, they know that we're going to work our, our butts off mm -hmm. and we're going to be perfect at these small little things in our game that we play. So, I, mm -hmm. I've modeled my weight room after that exact same thing. Like we will be perfect in the aspects of our game that we have to be perfect in mm -hmm. so that we're not going to lose a game due to a mental mistake. You might be outright better than us with talent and beat us by 10, but that extra 10 points you got, you had to earn every single point. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's my main focus for our, our kids in our weight room is to get them to realize that we have to earn what we want to get where there's no, nothing, nothing is distinguished. Nothing is, nothing is, is, uh, entitled i guess is a good word but yeah but we have to earn it to get it so that's the truth that is the truth so um when it comes to uh setbacks or potential issues what are what are the most common uh issues i guess that you deal with on a on a day-to-day -day or season by season basis um well what we have we have a lot of youth programs in our area um overuse over specificity under recovery is more when what i talk about with our, mm -hmm. our parents every august all of our team sports have a freshman parent meeting and then a full team parent meeting excuse me and uh i get i try to make as many as i can and talk about like you have to feed your our kids like mm -hmm. our there probably 85 percent of our kids do not eat enough to get the, the gains or the, the, the situation they want to aim for, mm -hmm. um, under recovery, like sleep, nutrition, water are the cheapest and easiest way to get yourself better at anything you're doing, but they're the most underutilized and, and underestimated things that we have out there. Like, mm -hmm. of course there's, there's no one marketing a good pillow. Like, you know, like, right. like there, there's people that are selling pre-workout, post-workout, intramus, intra-workout, all these crazy formulated boxes of whatever oh, yeah. and that seems sexier than the basics that you truly need our, mm -hmm. our five movement basics our sleep our nutrition and our recovery systems um as, as and that's more on the on the athlete side on on the faci our facilities or our logistics side um most high school coaches will tell you low space and low budget we, we mm -hmm. uh we are a state-funded school um with our area we live in, we're in an upper echelon socioeconomic status area, but mm -hmm. we are a very have to be a very efficient district because in the in the eyes of the state, the money comes in from the state and federal level based on uh, per kid that is in what a title nine title one situation. Um, with us having such a more upper echelon background in our our neighborhoods around us, we have a lot of retirees that are lots of money in their house. Um, that have no kids. So mm. um, we don't get much. We have maybe 10% of our total funding comes from state or federal money. So 
we have to fundraise, we have to budget, we have to figure out how to create money through the area that we live in, the businesses and, and sponsorships and donorships that we have. Um, and then our, our facilities, we're, we're working on a, a bond issue right now, trying to get it put through for a vote. But when you have people that don't use our, our facilities with students that are that have already have kids that have gone to college or retirees that have moved in, you don't want to have a, a smaller tax raise because there, it's not helping you at all, right? So mm -hmm. we're 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 lobbying. We're trying to get to the point where we're 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 we can get the things that we truly need to help, and in all aspects, not just athletics, but in our academic side, our classrooms need to be remodeled. Our mm -hmm. our our auditorium for the theater is, I think, 30, 40 years old and is out of spec and honestly out of code for a couple of the areas in there for like electricity and things. Um, so we're, we're working towards trying to get a bond put through on the budget side and our mm -hmm. facilities. Are, I mean, our our athletic wing, I think, was built in 95 or 97. And it was kind of like on the end of the last uh, the last bond that came through for athletics. So it was. I mean, it, it's good. It works. It, it keeps us semi dry when it rains. It doesn't leak too badly. <laughs> but we we work with what we got. So it, it's funny. Yeah. Like when, every time we hire a new coach, they come in because friends was pretty synonymous with with doing well in athletics and extracurriculars. We're always in the what's called the Lone Star Cup battle at the end of the year for extracurriculars and academics. Uh, the a point system hits. See who has the best school overall for what mm -hmm. what the kids are doing. And mm -hmm. we're always in the running in the top ten for that. And they, the new coach gets in here for their interview and they walk around with our AD and he's like, wait, this, this is it? Place? This is it? This is what y'all are rocking? <laughs> we're like, yeah, dude, like either you like it or go somewhere else looking for nice stuff. But we're going to mm -hmm. we're going to work our butts off with the stuff that we got. So, <laughs> well, yeah, Dave, so that was a perfect segue because we need to talk about how people can help you and help your school district and, and all of that get get some uh, improvements in the weight room. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing there. Well, um, we, we, like I said, we're, we're, it's a blessing and a curse. We, we don't get the, te the state and federal funding, but we have really generous and helpful people around the area um, that we can reach out. And we have a really high percentage of people that will, will be willing to help us wherever they can. Um, every year, we have a foundation at our, our at our district called the Education Foundation, and they bring together a whole bunch of generous, honest, good people that try to build up funds for us to use as fundraising for academics, athletics, extracurriculars on on the fine art side. And t every teacher in, uh, can apply for grants, which mm -hmm. will uh, say say that a uh, math teacher needs a new set of calculators. Instead of hoping for state funding to to cover that, we'll put in in november or or september for a grant for that and then it goes through the process the application either gets thumbs up thumbs down and and it's very rare that something gets thumbs down unless there is funds for it and then it goes to the education foundation who puts it online for anyone not just our community but anyone to go online and help us pay for mm -hmm. um i'm i'm lucky enough that i i'm not i'm not actually in the classroom i'm strictly strength just like uh there's i think May, I think maybe 20 or 25 of us in the state now that are strictly strength and conditioning, no, no teaching, no PE, nothing like that, that we're, we're considered a truly strength coach in the district. Mm -hmm. um, so since I am that and I am not in a budgetary situation with, so if, if our, our athletic director, he has a booster club, since he has a booster club, he can't put in for a grant because he can figure out funds through the booster club. Mm -hmm. I personally in the weight room do not have a booster or a booster club or any athletic budget funds for me directly. So I'm able to mm -hmm. post grants and get them applied for and granted at the, in each February. So um, actually this past Saturday, we had this big gala or, or, or get together for the foundation and all of our stuff got put online for the next 25 days. And I am scratching for, for a couple more things in the weight room. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, I, I, I usually have about 80, 75 to 80 kids in the weight room each time that uh, have a, a lifting group and we're piecing and parting together our, our bars for, for with plates. So like, especially on like a football, I, my football team is in there, my varsity and JV lifting together and we're anywhere above 70% of our, our, our rep max per se. Um, there aren't enough plates for the bars that I have. And, mm -hmm. and, I'm, and again, I'm, I'm blessed with what I have. I have 14 double-sided platforms 28 bars to use at any given time but the 
with, with that being said, I also have 600 kids that are trying to get in there at the same time. So it feels yeah. a little bit on the, uh, the whiny kid that already has something really good that he wants something better. But I don't have the space or the equipment inside that room to keep up with the amount of bodies I have. Mm-hmm. So this year I, I've, I've put together a, a grant for each platform to get more bumper plates that we can slide on for both deadlift, clean, squat, any hinge or, or push that we have with the straight bar mm-hmm. to have more weight in the weight room for the kids that are truly getting strong enough to handle more. Like I had a kid working for his, I think we got up to, I think 78, 80% of his, his, uh, his rep max. And, um, I think it was close to 315 and he had a 45, 25, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. <laughs> like it was just stacked out to the end with the collars on and it just looked so ridiculous. And I was like, dude, what are you doing? He's like, coach, there's no more weights in the weight room. I had to scrounge oh, for these. I was like, we truly are too strong for the weights that we have in our room now. And yeah. I mean, that, that's kind of gets me a little juiced up because we're, we are truly getting stronger within yeah. the means of risk and reward. But we, we are pr- uh, really working hard towards getting, those grants paid for so I can add more poundage in the weight room so that we're not having to share and, and mix bars up with, with the amount of kids that we have that truly are strong enough to handle more than what we have. Um, I think there, I have, so I have, I have 14 racks. I am, I have five grants left that are open right now. So mm-hmm. if anybody is listening that feels to be a little generous, can I check out, um, I'll, I'll send you the link and we can put it up somewhere. Um, it's uh, that if you go on to Google, type in Education Foundation Friendswood and click on the grants button, it'll bring you to it. And then you can search my name or search make the weight room heavier because I really just that was, that was literally what I'm trying it's to a great do. Name. So, so yeah. we, we, we called it make the weight room heavier. And uh, it's I, I think, like I said, I think um, there's four or five left because, again, we have some very generous people in the area that have, that have gone and helped me out with that. But we're, there's there's always a need. And. And we're, we're always trying to make things better for our kids. So if someone's willing and, and opening to try that, either contact me directly or or find the website through Google. And like I said, type in Education Foundation Friendswood and click on the grants link from there. Um, it would be awesome to see. And I will personally mail you a handwritten thank you letter. And I might give you a big ass hug if I see you in person because <laughs> it'll it'll make my life just a little bit easier with the amount of kids that I get to to that bless me each day with their effort and their attitude. So dude, that's, it's amazing that already you're, you're getting those grants filled. Like that's just a testament to, you know, to how much you care and how much the people around you notice that, you know, you're, you're doing these things for the right reasons. You actually care about these kids and, and, uh, you know, other, other people might not view that as a problem, but it's a genuine problem. Like your, your job is to get these kids into, you know, as good a shape as possible, you know, and if there's not enough weight for them to lift, like that's a problem, you know, that's a good problem to have, but it's still a problem. Yeah. You know, so shoot, man. Well, I think, uh, I'll, I'm going to post that link as soon as I find it and I'll, I'll get that up this week. Um, and, and hopefully we'll get, you know, we'll get those grants filled up. That would be well, awesome. I, I appreciate you segueing into that, man. I, I mean, I'm, uh, it's a blessing that you even let me talk about that. I, I, like I said, I don't try to get out there. I'm not trying to pander for money, but mm-hmm. there is a true, there is a true need there for my kids. And if I can bow down and help somebody else to, that can help me get my kids better, I'm, I'm going to do whatever I can for the kids that I work with. Cause I mean, they're, they're my kids too. So I, uh, I appreciate you letting me kind of talk about that like that. For sure, man. So, uh, this is a little bit of a, another segue, uh, okay. Do you have any of your high school athletes lifting heavy stones? I, uh, no. I, <laughs> it, Probably wise. <laughs> with the amount of time that I'm allowed to have and the, the minimal space that I have, I will rarely ever test a kid in something that's not directly correlated to having them better themselves. Um, yeah, I, I have a 150-pound med ball in, in that I got a while back just because I, I, I have a really good relationship with a – and actually, that's who I'm getting. I'm trying to get my bumper plates through as a company here in, in Houston called GetRx. They're uh, more of a CrossFit-based equipment company, but mm-hmm. they sell really good equipment for a really good price, and I can drive there, pick it up, and not pay for shipping and bring it back. 
Um, they're That's and they're awesome. legit, legit good people. I love them to death. I, like their showroom is pretty much in, like one of the baddest looking CrossFit gyms ever because they have all their equipment out for you ready to play with and use. Mm. Um, and I, I bought. I mean, I've in the past eight years through the Education Foundation and through very generous donations, um, I've been able to get brand new bars, uh, med balls, our our gymnast rings for our accessory exercises at our racks. Um, all of our bands and all of our like small accessory stuff I've gotten through them. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it's been really good relationship with them. They, they know that I'm going to come in and, and test their stuff out hard because I mean, 600 bodies twice a week. That's, I mean, over 600, like 1300 bodies every set five to seven days that, that I'm going <laughs> to see if something's going to break down quick. Right. Yeah. So they, oh, yeah. they've been really cool about letting me try some <laughs> of their new stuff and figure things out with them about what, how to make things better. So they're, they're a really good group of people that are helping let me, uh, uh, do really good stuff with their equipment. So, um, cool. you yeah, have to beta they, test it. They, the, the last time we bought all of our bars, we spent so much money with them that they're like, Hey, we got some new toys. You want to try it? I was like, what do you got? Well, we got these things called slam balls that we're trying out to see how they hold up. And we got this 150 and they knew that I was kind of in the strong man circuit at the time playing with heavy dang, things. So he was like, how about I get 50% off? We'll let you buy it. And I, I personally, with my own paycheck paid for that one just to have to play with. Mm-hmm. And I've been beating the crap out of it for six weeks, six uh, years now, and it's still holding up as a 150 pound metal. Like it's like metal dust inside to make it that heavy, wow. and that, that's the one thing that's kind of <laughs> close to what I would consider stone lifting in the weight room. And mm-hmm. we'll have a random kid walk up to it, like, "Coach, what is this?" And we'll we'll talk about it, and they'll try it. And of course, it's always awkward. And uh, <laughs> I, I was my my athletic director was like, "I'm really afraid of kids getting hurt with that thing being in the weight room." It's almost like, well, your grip is going to fail before your back does because mm-hmm. there's no handles. It's not like deadlifting 150. It, you're pretty much going to have to pressure and friction it between your forearms and your hands. And your, your, your hands will fail before your back or legs ever do. Mm-hmm. And he was like, okay, I just want to make it like, you know what you're talking about. I, 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 <laughs> I just know that, that it made, made him nervous to have this huge med ball in the corner of the weight room. Because if you put a ruler out there, a high school boy is going to test himself somehow with his friend next to that ruler. So oh, yeah. um, that med ball becomes a, a big testament with our O lineman and D lineman who can pick it up the, as many times in a minute or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's that, that, I guess that would be the closest thing that comes to what I do personally in, in the weight room as far. I mean, I have my, my yoke and my, my log bar in there, but those are kind of chained up off limits unless I'm in the weight room. The kids know not to touch my personal toys that are in the weight room without yeah. me there, just to make sure they're safe and, and being supervised and what they're doing for their extra extra lifts and things like that. So, yeah, that, that's as close as I get to letting them try any stone yet. <laughs> so, uh, tell us a little bit about your trip you've got coming up. Well, I uh, I'm planning on going this spring break in about gosh, I'm, I guess in about three four weeks now. I need to check my days left. Um, I'm planning this spring break to to fly over to Iceland to try myself against some of their the manhood stones there um mm-hmm. the the ones called the Husafell stone that's so uh, I guess more infamous than famous not not a lot of people know about it but in my circle of, of strongman and, and world of strength um a lot of people know about it as one of the oldest and most infamous tests of strength out there um mm-hmm. it, uh long uh, long story short Hundreds of years ago, there was a farmer in central Iceland that had a uh, a goat pen. That there's not much trees there, so they have, they make their walls out of stone and mortar. And he had a stone and mortar goat pen that was, I guess, about 50 meters around. And the gate stone, pretty much like what we'd have on hinges and piece of wood that would open up, was a 410 pound stone. <laughs> so to let his goats out, he would pick up a 400 pound stone, move it. Holy cow! And that was how he let his goats and his sheep out each time. Um, well, he had a, he had a, I guess one or two sons and a daughter and, uh, daughter was not getting paid as much per daily labor as the sons. And she, she wanted to get the same amount of pay. And he said, well, the day you can pick up the gate stone, then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. The next morning she wakes their butts up, gets them out there. She picks it up, walks it all the way around the goat pen and sets it back down. Like pay me my money for it. Like, so, <laughs> like, it's pretty awesome. And like, and like Iceland's actually really well known for how, forward thinking they are in women's rights uh, had the first woman president a really a really strong community of true physical and emotional strength in the female and males um like i guess in the top 10 past years of crossfit in the top five there's been three to ten different icelandic women in wow. that group so, like they 
they know how to grow strong humans and strong women in that same vein. Mm -hmm. Um, the olden day fishermen before they set out on into the fjords to go fishing, there was a fishing village near Driftic, which is one of the fjords that kind of goes out on the west side of the, of the island. Um, there was a, they called the Black Beach. It's a whole bunch of like black rock pebbles. And there were four stone there, stones there called the Driftic Stones that each level of stone that you're able to pick up showed how strong you were to the fishermen, therefore how much money you would be able to get paid on the cut of the money at the end of the day for the work mm. you were able to handle. Mm. So uh, they got the, the pretty, uh, honestly, pretty straightforward and ugly, angry names for each stone. Um, <laughs> the small, smallest one, I think, is like 55 pounds, and it's called Amlodi, which is weakling. Which means like you're you're a child and you should be able to get that. So that's like maybe like zero pay to, to minimum pay. Uh -huh. um, the next stone I think is 150 pounds and it's a a Hofstadinger, which is uh, a half lifter, and wow. uh, you get like a quarter pay. And then mm -hmm. the next one up is I think two around 250, and it weigh and it's uh, called half Hofstadinger, which is half strength. It means you mm -hmm. probably get half pay for that day or whatever labor you do. And then mm -hmm. the biggest one that was called full Sturker, which is 341 pounds. <laughs> if you get that to your chest, you're considered full strength and whatever job you're told to do on the boat, you'll get full pay for that day. Gotcha. So people would, people would move out to these fjords and, and put up these little shacks at the beach and wait for boats to come in looking for workers. And they go over to the rocks and see like, Hey, where are you at on the level? If you pick mm -hmm. up that full Sturker stone, you're getting full money for the day. You get on the boat and go get, make some money for your family. Yeah. And that was every, every fishing season, they'd all move out and then all move back home each year. So um, I think it's a really awesome testament to like why Icelandic people are so truly tough and able to handle I mean, strength world or not like just mm -hmm. how good they are at their their base strength and in and, and, and general because like they're gro they were grown from people of decades and generations of being based off of strength themselves so mm -hmm. uh I, this past summer uh both uh, Gar you're, you've already i'm not going to rehash it no garson <laughs> probably agnosium and <laughs> in, uh, in, on the scottish stones but uh yes. but i i was i went about two or three weeks before he did Mm -hmm. Um, and we, we both, uh, tried some stones there and just because I, I mean, I've been, I, I got done with college football and I had some demons left of competitiveness inside me trying to find where I could hash that out. And I'm training kids at, at universities and pro sport, getting them ready for battle every day. And mm -hmm. I, I still needed to get some of those demons out and I found strongman and did some amateur circuits from Houston to North Texas, central Texas, Louisiana, and Arkansas. And in that kind of hurt my shoulder pretty bad at Arkansas strongest man and got second place. Um, and he, uh, and I was talking to my wife who was pregnant at the time. She said, Hey, I don't want you to be in a wheelchair as a dad. Mm -hmm. I mean, so let's figure out something else we can do. So I got away from the strong man. So I just working out directly just for fitness, which fitness and, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, in my in kind of looking at different ways to train, I found out about these olden day stones. And that was kind mm -hmm. of how me and Garson kind of picked up the idea of how cool it would be to go touch these stones that thousands, hundreds and th hundreds of thousands of years ago, people tested themselves on. So mm -hmm. we both figured out ways to, to get ourselves over there last year. And then, like, um, I think he may have talked about it as well, but uh, Rogue put on some really cool documentaries, mm -hmm. both about Scotland and Iceland. Um, that really got us juiced up and like within that video coming out, like six months later, we were heading over there. So, um, <laughs> it, it helped me kind of research where they were as far as GPS and all that. So I, I was able to create a map that went all through the Northern Highlands. And I, I think I, I tried eight or nine, uh, of the, of the stones from each of the clans because that pretty much the same thing that Iceland, anywhere that like the Vikings could easily boat to and take over. They, there's, there's stones there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would have each clan would have a test. So you have to jump the length of your kilt or run under a sword without falling over or, or pick up this heavy stone uh, to your uh, to your waist, your chest or your shoulder to see how kind of like the levels of full Sturker in Iceland levels of strength. And if you were considered a full man, if you got it to your shoulder and took a hand off of it, wow. you'd be considered a real man. And actually get that's where you get a feather in your cap. That's where that statement comes from is from Scotland. Mm -hmm. Because the guys walking around in the clan with a feather in their hat meant that they were strong enough to handle whatever came. That's so, crazy. Yeah. yeah. So that that's where the Iceland <laughs> came. And after we finished Iceland, I was like, the ones in Iceland are, or sorry, Scotland, are, uh, the ones in Iceland are bigger and heavier. Let's try it. So next next I, step I, up, man. Yeah. So we, uh, I think there's a, <laughs> 11 stones in Iceland that I'm planning to go through. Um, I think the lightest is obviously the 50 pounder and the drift fix, which I'll, you know, 
I'll still do it just to say I did it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, I think the heaviest, they call it like the bear hug stone, but it's like the Brinhol Shrek, which is 620 pounds. Wow. Yeah. So uh, uh, that, that'll be, that'll be my, my tipping point if it's actually even possible for me to get it off the ground, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see how that one goes. Yeah. I mean, the, the crazy part is like, you can't really like prepare for it. Right. I mean, you, there's, there's a lot that you can do by lifting, you know, heavy stuff here, mm. but until you're, it's like right in front of you and you're like, okay, it's shaped this way. I've got to like figure out how to you know, what's going to be my strategy here? Like a lot of that you can't figure out until, you know, real time. Well, yeah, the, so, uh, the, the Scottish call it reading the stone. You, you, mm-hmm. when you walk up, you kind of like feel around it, see where the gripping points would be, mm-hmm. kind of pull it an inch or two off the ground to see where the balance point is, whatever the center line may be. And then once you read it, then you try to pull it from the floor so that it's not a failed attempt on your first try, which mm-hmm. it still may be because it could still be heavy as all hell. But, um, yeah, it, the, you read the stone once you get there, and like it, it's the, it's totally different than anything I've ever really done in in my my competitive sports or strongman days. Like, I've played at stadiums in college that had a hundred thousand people at Tennessee or ninety seven at Florida. They're all yelling and screaming at us or for us. Mm-hmm. Um, strongman, there might be ten people or a hundred people in the stands for the amateur circuit. Um, mm-hmm. Then they're screaming like because we're doing something pretty cool, but like with the stones in Scotland and, and most likely the same in the Iceland when we get there, no one's going to be there, but me and that rock. And my mm-hmm. wife was there and she was recording video just for fun. Um, but like, there's no crowds, there's no crazy big hoopla after you, you pass it. It's just you and the history of the fingerprints that have been on that stone. It's just this, this quiet calm after you. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it's such like a, an internal hubris thing for me, like to know that, <laughs> Maybe way back in the day, I might be considered able to be manly enough to handle what those dudes handled back then. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's, it's definitely like a little a, a pride check for me to see if I can handle what those dudes could. But I, they live much tougher lives than I ever have, mm-hmm. and uh, to see if I could ever be considered on par with some dudes that have truly lived a harder life than me. So, uh, for sure. Yeah, we're, we're also going for other reasons to Iceland. Uh, there's a whole bunch of cool things like swimming in between the tectonic plates and really cool waterfalls and crazy food like uh fermented shark and sheep's head that's baked in an oven and and then uh we're gonna get like geothermic bread where they actually cook bread in the ground that's so a- geothermically active that it's hot enough to cook bread wow so like we're gonna get a, a a reservation to go to this place where this dude literally puts a pot in the ground amongst this hot dirt and cooks bread every day it's this beautifully brown <laughs> rye bread that comes out of the earth so there's these little like really cool nuanced things that we're gonna go try that are kind yeah. of off the beaten path in the map of Iceland. So my wife is going to hopefully see some Northern lights. That's her number one thing to get done. And mm-hmm. I'm going to see some heavy rocks that, that might beat the crap out of me. So, <laughs> well, that, that sounds really awesome, man. It sounds yeah, like about, about a month away. So we're, we're, yeah. we're getting close. That's really cool. Sweet, man. Well, uh, um, yeah, man, we've, we're just rolling along here, man. We're covering quite a bit. So, um, a lot of the stuff that I see you post is 3D printing. So <laughs> what got you into that and uh, and what can't be 3D printed? Well, I, uh, I'm a firm believer in somehow turning your brain off of whatever you consider your occupation or your labor. Because if you're 100% in 100% of the time, even the best computer out there in the world is going to overheat. Mm -hmm. Um, you have to shut down, you have to reset, you have to restart somehow. And I mean, that's how burnout happens in youth athletes. You, you can't a hundred percent all year round. You're going to start hating it at some point. Mm -hmm. Um, and not, not that I ever feel like I'm hating my job, but I truly believe that when I'm here from six 30 to six 30, I'm, I'm going to put in a hundred percent or as much as I can that day for the kids that I'm working with. If they're choosing to risk their body to get better, I'm going to put in everything I have try to be as positive as outgoing as fun and as as motivating as i can when i'm here Mm -hmm. so when i go home i don't want to have to do ones and zeros excel spreadsheets planning and doing all that i want to spend time with my kids hug my Mm -hmm. wife have dinner and then once everybody goes to bed i'll go outside in my garage and 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 build something um nice the the 3d printing (laughs) side i uh again so like i said i'm not a big big social media guy I'm not putting a whole bunch of stuff out there. My, my personal Instagram account is the only Instagram account I have. 
And it's literally like me going to the park with my kids, me building some random thing for someone to ask me. And I mean, it's, it's a side hustle. I'll, I'll make a buck here or there, but most of my stuff's just for fun. Um, mm-hmm. uh, the 3D printing is the newest thing. I, I've, I've been woodworking and carpentry for pretty much my whole life. I have a, uh, an engineer father that's the son of a farmer. So we're, we're, I mean, I'll work with my hands and I'll plan the hell out of it. So mm-hmm. I, uh, I've been, I've been, if it's made out of wood, concrete, or, um, or steel, I can, I can probably build it. If you show me a picture, I can make it. Mm. Um, but I have a router CNC, a 3d printer and a laser CNC now that pretty much I press start after I plan it out and it builds something for me while I'm doing something else. So it, it has, it has snowballed my time in building and, ma- and making things now. Um, but as far as a 3d printer, um, my knowledge of it's very low at this point. I'm still <laughs> very elementary. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not very too good at the whole computer side of things, but if, uh, if I can see it, I can, I can figure it out. And, mm-hmm. um, as far as what can't be printed, um, I know that there's thousands and thousands of dollars worth of 3d printers out there that can make things out of wood with a filament and, and, and melting process that creates something out of wood. Wow. Um, there's ones that can do tin, aluminum, and brass because it gets hot enough to melt those metals into the into position. Um, plastics, ABS, PLA, uh, I3, I3C, a whole bunch of different kinds of plastics that can handle. I mean, even like silicone, like like mushy, like squish toys that you give a dog, you can print those out in some of the, the better printers. Wow. I, I spent $150 on my printer and built it myself. So I'm not saying it's anywhere near level or, or really good, <laughs> but it does get the job done. Um, what, on the things that I've built so far, I mean, I've made some hinges for a part for my son's toys that needed that broke. And I had to rebuild, mm-hmm. um, like, lots of little things. It's, it's nothing too big. I made I saw some rings for a friend. So. Yeah, I was just about to say, I saw a lightsaber or two. So if <laughs> I, you can I've build actually, that, <laughs> I've actually gotten into some semi minor production of that. Cause there's been a, a high May the 4th is coming. So mm-hmm. there's been some some high cause for me building a, a couple more of those. So I got to make some Darth Vader red ones and some <laughs> nice. some uh, some Samuel L. Jackson. I can't remember his the character purple. name, but yeah, purple Mace lightsaber. Mm-hmm. Ah, there you go, Mace Windu's uh, mm-hmm. purple one with with the gold handle on it and all that. So I gotta I gotta figure out my colors and things like that. So it'll nice. be an interesting process. But I, I am I am in minor production of that. So that's um, cool. As far as what you can't print. It's all based on my ability and my my allowance of knowledge. So that's why I'm out on the what I can't print. That's awesome, sweet. So, um, how can uh, aside from the uh, uh, you know donating to to the weight room, how can people find you? How can they follow you? How can they uh, how can they be more involved in uh, in yeah, just being part of of what you're doing on a day to day basis. I, I am a, I'm a big proponent of being generous with your time, talents, and resources. Um, if you want to direct email me at my school email, I will talk shop with whoever, whenever, and I will answer that. My, my email is dacardo, my last name, which is uh, we talked about earlier, is a kind of a train wreck, uh, d-a-c-c-a-r-d-o at f-i-s-d-k-1-2.net. So it's a very long email, but uh, if you email my school email, I am always down to talk shop about pro- periodization, programming, abilities of young athletes, whatever it is. You want to talk about any kind of strength and conditioning or shoot the crap, whatever you want to do. We'll talk talk mm-hmm. about how your day is going. So yeah, shoot me an email there. Um, like I said, my Insta, uh, my Instagram account is more personal. Not really. I really don't put very much on my training side there. Mm-hmm. Um, but my my Twitter is a a a team Twitter. It's my, it's for we, all of our, all friends with athletics. Each Twitter starts with F woods and then whatever sport it is. So I am at F wood, F W O O D S T R E N G T H at F wood strength, um, on Twitter. So that'll be maybe once or tw- once every two weeks, I'll put a video up or whatever. And I'm more, yeah. I'm more of a consumer than a, than a productive, uh, person on Twitter. I'm, I'll retweet things of guys that I truly and girls that I truly uh, relate to and truly trust and, and think that their knowledge is out there. So that the six kids that are following me on there, cause they know that I'm very, not very fun to follow. But, uh, <laughs> if they, if they I see something that's truly honest and, and good information for, for whoever's following me to have, I'll retweet that. But like I said, I'm more of a, 
a, a consumer than a producer on Twitter. So, gotcha, awesome. And uh, let's uh, let's wrap it up, man. So if uh, if you could give anybody watching or listening one piece of advice, or or leave us with a, a quote or or something along those lines, how uh, how would you how would you end it? Truly try to find what you love doing. Um, if, if you choose to take 20 years of your life to dread waking up in the morning, that's on you. Like, you have to figure out truly what you love to do. Um, the, the Japanese have an awesome thought process called Ikigai, and it's, uh, it's a concept of a reason for being for humans. Um, there's four stages of it that you have to find something that fits all four for you to truly feel fulfilled in this world that's so crazy. Um, you have to find something you love to do, something that the world needs, something that you're good at, and something that you can be paid to do to survive. Mm. So if you fit into all four of those, you are in and what you do. And that could be a day-to-day process. Like today, I truly feel that I'm hitting all four. But tomorrow, I might be like, yeah, I'm not very good today. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. But like overall, like if you can hit those four markers in what you do, you're truly in a form that is a life worth living and you can go ahead and keep going. But if, if you're doing something that you love and you're good at, but you're not getting paid for it and a, the world doesn't really need it, it's more of a passion. Mm-hmm. If you're doing what you love, the world needs it, but you're not getting paid for it and you're not good at it, it's more of a mission. Mm-hmm. If you can get paid for it and the world needs it, but you don't love it and you're not good at it, it's more of a vocation. Mm. if you can get paid for it and you're good at it but you don't love it and the world doesn't need it it's more of a profession and you're just going getting by mm. um then, then and then it gets down into more more detail if you want to look it up it's a kai a, sorry a k i g a i ikigai and mm. it really breaks down into what truly matters for a human being to to develop and feel fulfilled each day and mm. so that, that would be my my biggest proponent for people that i talk to like even my high school kids, when they're about to graduate and go off to college, like, what are you doing? Oh, no, I'm going to get them a prereqs and figure it out. I was like, okay, well, when you say figure it out, try and find these four things. And that could change in 10 years anyway. You know, like a yep. 16, 18 year old doesn't truly know what the world needs. But mm-hmm. like as you get older, you can then formulate and figure out the next chapter of your life. But like I, uh, I would say, yeah, the, the, the thought process of Ikigai is a, is a great proponent to help anyone in any stage of life see where they're at and, and how to, either alter what they're doing or or alter the world around what they're doing so yeah man i think it, it can be so difficult sometimes if you're in a position where you're like i don't feel like i'm making a difference or i don't i don't feel fulfilled or you know like maybe i'm making enough money or maybe i'm not making enough money and and if you're not really evaluating things through that you know, through those four lenses, it can be really difficult to like, okay, where, where do I make a change? But that kind of simplifies it in a way that's like, okay, like I'm, I'm addressing things here and I'm, I'm addressing this and, and, you know, I can kind of check those off, but here's where, you know, here's where my life is lacking. And maybe that's why I'm not feeling fulfilled at the end of the day, man, that just simplifies it down and, you know, into a way where you can, (laughs) where you can, you can adjust things. And then, yeah, you can have a really fulfilled life. So, I, like, I think that's going to be a really good way just to, um, you know, I'm going to spend a couple minutes today just to evaluating those things. For sure. So, well, and, like, the, the American thought process is, it ha- is have, like, I think, four hobbies. One that makes you money. One that, that gets you healthy and fitness. One that helps your mindset. One that helps you calm or whatever it is. But, mm-hmm. like, that, that's a more drawn out. That's saying you have to have multiple things to get you there. But if, you're, if your true job is those four things and you shouldn't have to add anything. But like, like I said, I, I turn my brain off when I get home mm-hmm. because some days this job is tough, man. Like I got high school kids that are going through some really real crap every day. And mm-hmm. they come to my couch or my office and talk to me about all these heavy things they're going through. Mm-hmm. And that's a, that's a burden that I, I, I purposely hold, but it, it gets tough at times. So like when I go home, I turn my mind off. I'm planning on like finding that, that, what I'm good at, what I need, what I can get paid for, and then what I love. And I love doing this job, but sometimes I need a little extra to to feel like I'm still fulfilled in all aspects of my life. So, you know, sure. like I said, yeah, it, it's a it's a good process to kind of go through. Everyone it doesn't have to be every day. You can do it every day if you want to, but mm-hmm. if you start feeling like you're 
complacent or uncertain or empty in some way or feeling useless or or not feeling delight maybe it's a, a good thing to go fall back on and figure out mm-hmm. i agree man dude that's so awesome thank you so much for taking the time to do this this has been uh it's it's been awesome man it's been a great conversation i've learned a lot and uh i know everybody watching and listening has as well so um best of luck uh in iceland give us a yeah man give us a um kind of a recap once you're done there and uh, for sure yeah i may i may post some pictures on my my work twitter some of the coaches said they want to see it on there so i well i might use it for that we'll see Awesome. Awesome. All righty. Well, stay tuned for next week's episode. And uh, if you can go, uh, go donate and uh, make David's weight room heavier. Much appreciated, brother. Awesome. All righty. Have a good one.